Many questions actually on just the exposure of banks in general. We have a good chart looking at what European bank stocks have been doing overall as an industry in Europe. It's down 25% since the invasion of Ukraine. It, the worry is what? Exposure to certain bonds or the fact that they have operations there? You see, uh, typically um, when you have a major... Uh, catastrophe like this one, the first reaction of investor is to look at the overall gross exposure, all the gross assets, and assume all of them are losses. In reality, we've been running an analysis uh, based on what happens if this is a 1998 scenario, so deflagration tomorrow of all the Russia, so 100% default and basically chaos, or it's more likely like a 98-99 scenario or a 2008-2010. The good news for investors is currently the market is pricing basically two to three times a 1998 scenario. So basically mm -hmm. that you know you have 100% losses on sovereign debt, corporate debt, and the total fallout basically of all Russia, uh, which I think is premature but, for the time being. As a so result, David, I think uh, stocks have more than priced this. Even some of the individual banks, I mean, how do we know about the exposure and some of the second and, and third round effects of freezing a, such a huge country? It's the 11th biggest in the world on some European banks that have direct links, including the Italian banks. Of course. So there are two types of exposure. You have the direct exposure funded in ruble. So you borrow ruble in Russia, you lend ruble in Russia. That's basically Unicredit and Sokgen. They have about 1% market share uh, in Russia. Uh, so the worst that can happen is you leave the equity and the keys. That's what happened to Santander in Venezuela. That's what happened to Santander in uh, Argentina already and, you know, in the tequila crisis to pretty much anyone. Um, second exposure is if you have cross-border exposure. So you're lending money yeah. out of uh, Paris, London, New York uh, to basically Russian corporates. Uh, for example, yeah. uh, JP Morgan and Bank of America, probably the most exposed banks to Gazprom. And that it depends uh, because, you know, the, they can pay and they're not under sanction. Uh, and as a result, and if your exposure is cross-border and not domestically, you're probably going to get paid back. So it all depends what's going to happen um, over the next couple of months. Uh, but yeah. I would assume that currently the domestic exposure is more than priced two to three times in terms of potential expected losses. Then there are clearly yeah, they... the third round effect. Yeah, yeah, go ahead on the third round. Sorry. Third round, it's uh, the global macro repercussion out of this. Uh, it's too early to tell. Uh, but clearly, this was to lead to a massive recession. So let's assume GDP in next two years goes minus five in Europe. Then that's probably not priced in. But we don't think that's the case. But in terms of the second round effects, I mean, do you assume that, you know, Fortress Diamond, JP Morgan, will be able to deal, even if they have a huge exposure and something ugly happens with Gazprom, that they'll be able to deal with it? But some of the more smaller European banks are much more vulnerable. And again, when do we find out? And is it the Swiss banks or is it the Italian banks? Well, I think the Italian banks don't have, you know, as I said, Unicredit has a domestic operation. So, you know, they lent 80 ruble, they borrowed 100 ruble domestically. So they're insulated. There's no cross-border exposure. Worst come worst, they leave the keys. For Intesa, it's even minimum. It's only cross-border and, and it's to main, mainly European corporates which have business in Russia. Uh, so basically, mm -hmm. uh, the credit risk remains European. Um, Sokgen the same. One which is at risk is Raiffeisen uh, in Austria. They have more exposure, but to their whole region, if you include also Kazakhstan and Ukraine. Um, and they are, in my view, for example, they suspended the dividend, so they're taking care. They're the one more exposed as percentage of equity and loans, um, and it's uh, small Austrian banks. So has it, you know, changed the way how you want to invest in European banks because of third round effects or you're still fully committed to some of the share prices that are actually below uh, certainly their U.S. counterparts? No, actually, I think the um, in my experience, having lived through uh, particularly the uh, 98 Russian crisis, having lived through the Korean shables and all the various emerging market crises,
I think this is a great time to step in stocks, the ones which are very well capitalized under the ECB uh, with massive protection uh, because the opportunity is pretty unique. And here, as I said, the market has priced three, four times the worst case 1998 scenario, which was full deflagration of Russia. <laughs> Uh, so it means you apply a zero to pretty much any Russian assets, debt, or loans that you have. And if you price it two, three times, the worst is already in the price. David, we have this story on the Bloomberg terminal through our reporting. Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, we understand, have been purchasing some beaten down company bonds in Russia or tied to Russia in uh, recent days. Wall Street seems to be pouncing on Russia's cheap corporate debt. We haven't been able to get comment from those companies. So that's something to bear in mind. But how big of a reputational risk is there in buying things that could give you returns but are linked to Russia right now? Well, I think the first issue is whether it's legal or not legal. I'm sure both Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan are all acting within what is legal. So, for example, I know that in Europe, for example, you cannot buy uh, ETF linked to Russia. You cannot put new trades. You can only sell. Uh, the good question is where you're selling to. So who is allowed to buy on the other side? That's a regulated entity. Um, then if it's a U.S. debt uh, traded in the U.S. Uh, of a major Russian corporation, it could be that if you're not sanctioned, so let's assume Gazprom, uh, because, you know, oil and gas are not within the uh, sanction list for the time being, you might be able to own it. Um, at that point, when it becomes sanctioned, uh, you cannot buy more. Uh, I don't know whether you can sell. It all depends what the regulator wants. Uh, clearly, I think if they were doing it, we're talking about tiny amount of capital. You know, um, last week, uh, Spare Bank had a market cap of $140 million. So, you know, even if you buy 1%, uh, you know, you're investing $1.5 million, which is basically, you know, a millisecond within J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs balance sheet. So it's completely irrelevant. It's a great story. It doesn't matter yeah. anything from the amount point of view. But do, do you think markets now need to look at morality, even if some of these companies are not sanctioned? I think uh, markets need to look at the law. Uh, it's not markets' job uh, to be moral. It's market job to be legal uh, because, you know, the morality is given to politicians to set up the rules and we follow the rules. Uh, we're not elected people. <laughs> the elected people are those that set the rules. And hence, I think they are the only one that can decide what is moral and not moral. And they give us law, which we all respect and follow.